So good afternoon, everybody. This is this is the beginning. So welcome to you all. And uh, yeah. we know we have some very interesting and uh, fascinating things to hear from our three speakers. But first, I'll tell you about the next meeting, which is on the 27th of June. Those uh, that afternoon, we shall be again having three speakers, some of whom will be familiar to you, um, some possibly not. Uh, so the three speakers are John Howson and Katie Ryder and a man called John Francis, who um, I'm pretty sure he'll be talking about Ray Fawn Williams because that's uh, that's his his subject. So we hope to see uh, nearly everybody there well and, and fit. So to this afternoon, uh, we have, as I say, three speakers. Uh, really looking forward to hearing from each one of them. First of all, we have Nia Daniel, who's uh, in Wales. And I know Nia has been, um, well, submerged, I think, possibly between uh, beneath an archive of uh, large quantities. <laughs> so she's come up for some air and going to talk to us this afternoon about what she's found there. So Nia, would you like to take over? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nia and I'm going to uh, share my screen with you now. So I'm going to talk to you today about the archives of Phyllis Kinney and Meredith Evans at the National Library of Wales. The National Library of Wales is situated in Aberystwyth. It was established in 1907 and it's one of six legal deposit libraries in the UK. This infographic shows that as well as books and periodicals, we also have newspapers, archives and manuscripts, paintings, maps and photographs. The library is also home to the National Screen and Sound Archive of Wales with film, video and sound archives. The National Library holds the most extensive collections of Welsh music in the forms of printed materials, manuscripts, archives and audio and video recordings of performances. I work as the programme manager for the Welsh Music Archive, which was established in 2017 in order to collect and to promote the use of our music archives. We preserve the oldest extant written music from Wales, which is the Penpont Antiphonal from the 14th century, and the most recent compositions and performances by our contemporary musicians. The Welsh Music Archive encompasses classical, folk and pop music, but today I'll talk about the folk music archives and in particular the archives of Phyllis Kinney and Meredith Evans at the National Library of Wales. They were affectionately known as Mered and Phyllis and I'll refer to them in that way from now on. This photo is from the project launch back in September 2017. The portrait is of Meredith Evans by Will Jones. His wife Phyllis is to the left of the painting and their daughter Elined by the side of her mother. Hello? I can hear some noise, is that okay? Someone was unmuted. I've just muted them. OK, I'll carry on then. We are very grateful to the family for all their continuing support. And I'm pleased to see that Aline Ed has joined us today. The National Library of Wales is home to many important manuscripts and archives relating to Welsh folk and traditional music. We have a web page here, which is a good place to start to find out what we have. It lists some key manuscripts and important printed collections. The library has digitised many key collections, such as the publications of John Parry in 1742 and Edward Jones later on in the 18th century, and John Parry Barthalau and Nicholas Bennett in the 19th century. These are all now online. 
We also hold the Welsh Folk Song Society archives and papers of renowned performers and harpists such as John Roberts Tylenor Cymru and John Thomas Pencerth Gwalia and collectors such as Maria Jane Williams and Ruth Herbert Lewis and the collection is still growing. We hold the archive of J. Lloyd Williams, who was one of the founders of the Welsh Folk Song Society, Cymdeithas Alawon Gwerin Cymru, established in 1906 to promote the collection and study of traditional Welsh folk songs. He became the first editor of the Society's journal. His archive includes many important earlier manuscripts collections of songs which he had collected for example, the manuscripts of Ivor Carey of 1815 and the fiddler John Thomas, 1752. The archive includes numerous collections of folk songs and hymn tunes accumulated by J. Lloyd Williams, including material which he himself had recorded and items submitted to him by others. He was a collector of manuscripts and a collector of songs and encouraged his students, a group known as a Canorion, to collect songs for him. They gathered over a hundred songs and one of them is Adar Man a Mynydd, which I'll play for you now. It's taken from the double CD Mered, published by Sign Records. Adar Man a Mynydd, The Little Mountain Birds, is a song in which a lover sends his ailing sweetheart a nightingale, a lark and the little mountain birds. They return with the sad news that she is dying. He will mourn her death to the sound of the harp and tolling bell. Here the song is sung in Welsh by Mered with harp accompaniment. <laughs> A cadar man a mynydd, a ewch i'n gen a gan at liw'r hân, sy'n glaf o gledd This is a picture of Mered and Phyllis at home in Mered's study. Mered and Phyllis both spent a lot of time researching in the library. By this I mean they were one of our most regular researchers for many, many years. They used to sit side by side in our reading room and although working on different aspects of research, they also worked as a team. Occasionally you could hear singing coming from the reading room. 
They have probably seen every relevant manuscript we have and also researched material in other Welsh institutions. Mered in particular spent a lot of time researching the archive of J. Lloyd Williams. He actually helped with the cataloguing of that archive. Mered sadly died in 2015 and from then onwards his archive and the archive of Phyllis was transferred from their home in Cumastwith to the National Library. It contains over 150 boxes of their research papers into Welsh folk music and their index cards on Welsh traditional music. There are files of research for publications, lectures and conferences, also correspondence and material relating to Mered's campaign for the Welsh language and his files on philosophy. I'm currently working on an online catalogue and it's a real treasure trove of material for anyone interested in Welsh culture and particularly folk music. Mered or Mered Evans was born on the 9th of December 1919 and died on the 21st of February 2015. Mered was a singer and folk song collector. This slide shows the cover of an album by Mered published by Sign Records in 1976. Mered was a pivotal figure in the development of music in Wales. He spent his life contributing to Welsh life and culture as a singer, an avid collector, historian, musician, editor, nationalist and campaigner for the Welsh language. He was also a philosopher, lecturing and writing about philosophy. He has been an inspiration to Welsh folk musicians throughout his life from his work as Head of Light Entertainment at the BBC Wales from 1963 to 1973, to assisting the young musicians such as Callan in more recent times. Mered was a talented performer, recording an important selection of songs for Folkway Records in New York in 1954, and later for the Sign record label. The next song I would like you to hear is taken from the Sign Record Mered CD published in 2005. It is called A Venue Vine, Slender Lass. This song was noted in North Pembrokeshire and was published in the Folk Song Society Journal around 1950. The song is in Welsh and is about a man who travelled to London and other large towns and also to Spain and Scotland searching for a slender lady. She was neat of body, slim of waist, her little fingers as white as hawthorn blossom. After they were married, they had two small children. One was higher than the chair and the other a tiny tot. Oh, I have it spine of Scotland. Oh, I have it spine of Scotland. Oh, I will you when you are. Oil and the horf and gumus. Oh, I can eat glass and wine. Oh, I possess back in one head. Oh, I possess back in one head. Oh, I blood a brick dry. All in in die brioti. Oh, I shall die of blood to Oh, Roedyn yn uwch na'r gader, o, roedyn yn uwch na'r gader, o, ar y llall yn hen bitw bach. Trafa i li Mered's music archive includes 37 boxes of material. 
here's my colleague Meredith Apeu looking through the boxes when they first arrived at the library in July 2015. There is material relating to his many lectures and publications on Welsh folk music. The Welsh Folk Music Society published many of his and Phyllis's collections. He was interested, as I have already said, in J. Lloyd Williams and the history of the Welsh Folk Society, and also in other collectors and publishers and poets. He was very interested in the words, the lyrics and poetry, while Phyllis was mostly interested in the musicology as a trained musician. There are many files on ballads, antelutes, carols, lullabies and love songs. He took part in radio and television programmes about Welsh folk songs and people would send him songs. He kept many scrapbooks of songs arranged methodically and alphabetically. Phyllis Kinney was born in 1922 and she would be celebrating her 99th birthday on the 4th of July, Independence Day. I took this photo of her uh, in 19, uh, 2019 at her home. She was born in Pontiac, Michigan, near Detroit. And in 1947, she became the lead solo with the Carl Rosa Opera Company. And while touring in Bangor, North Wales, met Meredith Evans, whom she married in 1948. Their married life was mostly spent in Wales, apart from a period of eight years from 1952 to 1960, which they spent in America. After returning to Wales, she contributed to BBC Light Entertainment programmes as a singer and also became a presenter and specialist researcher for television programmes. She has spent the last few decades researching music manuscripts and publications at the National Library of Wales and also in St Fagan, Cardiff and Bangor University. This was the background to her notable work, Welsh Traditional Music, published by the University of Wales Press in 2011, which is the authoritative book on Welsh traditional music from its beginning to the present day. I cannot recommend this book enough, especially to a non-Welsh speaking audience interested in Welsh folk music. It's still available in printed or electronic format from the publishers. She has also contributed numerous articles to journals and has published several books on Welsh folk music and song books for children, some co-authored by Mered. She was awarded an honorary master's music degree by the University of Wales in 91 and became honorary fellow of Bangor University alongside her husband in 1997. Phyllis Kinney's research files were transferred to us in July 2015 in over 30 boxes. They cover her research for Welsh traditional music and other publications. There are research notes on the oral tradition, the move from manuscript to print, Edward Jones and traditional airs, seasonal festivities, carols, ballads and the antelute, the early collectors, Yolo Morganog and Ivor Carey, J. Lloyd Williams and the Welsh Folk Song Society, musical instruments and everything in between. Her files contain detailed and meticulous notes and analysis of tunes with information about musicians and collectors of music. She is very systematic in her approach, looking at rhythm, cadence, form, harmony and modes and tune families. This is just one example from her file entitled Tunes Not in Edward Jones, where she has noted all the different versions of the song Hivena Kurumelin, which she, she has found in different sources. Edward Jones, known as the King's Bard, published five collections of tunes between 1784 and 1825. I don't expect you to be able to read this list of 18th century ballad tunes, but it's an example of the meticulous list she created and arranged and rearranged according to her research needs sometimes arranged alphabetically 
or by period, collection or mode. This one is arranged in order of popularity, noting the dates and also the sources. Thousands of index cards on traditional Welsh music have been digitised and are now available online. These vary from one group to the next, and some are created by Mered, some by Phyllis, and some by both. Usually Mered's emphasis is on the words and Phyllis on the tunes. There are index cards for folk songs, over a thousand index cards arranged by title A to Z, tunes for carols noted by Phyllis Kinney, words for carols noted by Mered, nursery rhymes, um, songs from the Lays of My Land, published in 1896 by Nicholas Bennett, which includes over 500 tunes. Mary Lloyd and notes on the traditions of wassailing and seasonal festivities. J. Lloyd Williams again and the Welsh Folk Song Society Journal. The cards indicate the tune and the words, differing versions, names of places associated with, associated with the tunes and indicate the book or manuscript where they have been found. Now that they have been digitised, the next stage is to make them easily searchable. We are working on a project to transcribe the information through a crowdsourcing project to help create a searchable spreadsheet. The Welsh Folk Song Society and also Alina Evans have volunteered to help us with a pilot project for transcribing the lullabies and we hope to move on to transcribe many more over the next few years. This is a picture of Gwenan Gibbard in the archives. She is a talented harpist and singer who has won a doctoral scholarship to study the contribution of Dr Meredith Evans and Phyllis Kinney to the field of folk music in Wales. This is a joint project between the National Library of Wales, the School of Music and Media at Bangor University and the College Cymraeg Cenedlaethol Welsh College. So to finish, here is a duet sung by Mered and Phyllis. It is a dialogue song called A Dare in Dee Sin Rhodiwr Gwledydd, The Wondering Blackbird, sung with their characteristic humour. It's taken from the sign Mered CD and originally uh, recorded for Delis Records. It is an excellent interpretation of a dialogue song between the young man, sung by Mered, and the bird, sung by Phyllis. J. Lloyd Williams noted this song from the singing of John Morris, the Canorion Society member, who had heard it sung in the Festiniog and Chasfynydd areas. In it, a young man asks a blackbird for matrimonial advice. Dear blackbird who roams the countries, who knows the old and the new, could you advise a young lad who has been alone for more than a year? Would you give me advice? The bird, sung by Phyllis, asks him, what's wrong? Is he heartbroken? Mered replies that he can't decide who he should marry. Phyllis suggests, what about the farmer's daughter? Mered agrees, yes, that's the girl I want. Thank you and farewell. Uh-huh. 
I hope that I have managed to convey some of the passion that Mairead and Phyllis showed for Welsh folk music. They were meticulous in their research and incredibly generous in sharing their knowledge with others. Now that their archives at the library, it will be available for all to see and I'm sure that many researchers and musicians will benefit from their outstanding work. Here are my details and you're welcome to get in touch for more information. Thank you for listening. Nia, thank you so much for that talk. That was absolutely wonderful. And you did manage to convey about them personally. They sounded absolutely lovely people and, uh, and certainly their amazing achievement. So thank you very much. And I can see lots of hands clapping in, uh, in thanks as well. That's great. We do have time for some questions. Um, so I think you know how to do that already. Down at the bottom bar, there's uh, it's participants, isn't it? Oh, oh, no, sorry, it's reactions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question. Oh, we have one already. Uh, Steve Gardham, if you'd like to unmute and ask yours. Yeah, I've got a couple of things really. I'll, I'll keep two of them because uh, they're just comments and I'll keep them for an email. Uh, the, the question is, um, in, in the English speak, speaking tradition, uh, traditional songs are probably 90%, if not more, uh, ba uh, ballads, uh, narrative. Uh, but that is very different to the Gaelic tradition, which is uh, more sort of uh, lyric type songs. Um, what sort of rough percentage of, of Welsh folk song are narrative or, or you know could be called ballads in that sense um that's it i don't know is the is the the answer um if you email me i can look into that for you okay thank you okay thank you then um conrad you have a question for us for me anyway. i unmute myself here hi there um very nice presentation it's always good to hear of new new sources. I do a lot of work with Mari Louis, and I was wondering if you had any actual um, artifacts as well as your, your documents and manuscripts, recordings. Do I have what, sorry? I have artifacts in your collection, such as a, a Mari Lloyd or a, a other things. Oh, um, no, as, um, as a general rule, uh, artifacts are kept by the museum. The museum is in Cardiff, the library and archives are in Aberystwyth. Um, mm -hmm. So we don't have objects as such in the archive. It's good to know where they are. Sometimes they come with the manuscripts associated. Thank you very much for this presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. And Lisa Null, you have your hand up. If you'd like to unmute, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. The little photograph of the instrument at the end of the presentation, was that what, I don't know how to pronounce it, a crowth? Yeah, that, that is a, a crowth. Oh, okay. Uh, that is the instrument that we have at the National Library, and it's one of three or four remaining crowths, which are original from the 18th century. May I ask if... Um, John Wright, who I, we had a record company that did a record of John Wright and Catherine Perrier uh, in France. And John, who was, who was English, became deeply involved in the Cruth, in research into the Cruth. And I wondered whether any of his research has come your way and whether there has been a lot of either res, uh, research or revival performance of the Cruth since his death. Um, I, I don't know of John Wright, but the, there are people at the moment who are performing on the cruise. Uh, Cass Meyrig, especially, um, a few other names. Uh, we have occasionally people coming into the library uh, to see the cruise. 
um, especially instrument makers who are building their own instruments based on um, the instrument we've got. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. And so Martin Nail, would you like to unmute? Yeah. Yes, thank you. A wonderful talk. Um, you, one moment you mentioned a book by uh, Phyllis Kinney, which you said was the best introduction to Welsh folk music. I wonder if you could put the details of that in, in the chat. Thanks. That's the one. <laughs> Welsh traditional music. Thank you. It's the uh, University of Wales Press. It, it's probably on their website. Okay, thank you. Okay, you I won't go far wrong if, if you've got that book by, by your side. <laughs> Thank you. I can see I'm going to sneak Frankie in as the last question. It's not a question. It's oh, go on. I, it's information. Um, we work closely with Bob Evans, Robert Evans, and it was in fact he who really revived the cruise uh, by being, he was an instrument maker, researching it, measuring it, reviving it, and he plays it quite regularly. In fact, he'll be playing it in two nights' time in our um, song and music share here in Cardiff. So, uh, as I say, I just want to say Robert Evans, in fact, I've worked with him. One of my albums has he, him um, accompanying me on the cruise for some ballads. Yes, that, thanks for saying that. Also, um, Bethan Miles has done a lot of research um, at the library and she's written um, her dissertation on the cruise. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nia. That was really very fascinating and lovely to hear and obviously has prompted a lot of thought and response from people. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we will move on to our next speaker. We're going east and certainly from where I am, we're going north a bit. Um, here we're going to hear about some songs that are within most of our living memories. And uh, it's a subject I have to say I had not come across before, and I think it's a wonderful title. It's uh, the sort of title that trips off the tongue. So, uh, Stephanie Smith, if you'd like to tell us about your Ding Dong Dollar songs. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, uh, all right. Uh, And sorry about this, I need to go back. There we go. Uh, all right. Um, I stumbled across the Ding Dong Dollar songs when I was working on my PhD at the School of Scottish Studies at the University of Edinburgh in the 1980s. I had done a, a master's thesis on Lizzie Higgins in the 1970s, so I, I had to go back. And um, Hamish Henderson suggested to me that I might write my PhD thesis on the Fisher family, focusing on Archie, Ray, and Scylla. I interviewed them and a lot of other singers and key figures in order to create an oral history of the Scottish folk revival for a chapter. Many people I interviewed mentioned these protest songs from the early 1960s, which intrigued me. My research on these songs connected with my later career as an archivist in the Ralph Rinsler Folklife Archives at the Smithsonian, which houses the Moses and Francis Ash collection of which Folkways Records is a part. Folkways put out a recording in 1962 called Ding Dong Dollar. Here is the first song on the recording, which is probably the best known, perhaps. Oh, you can't spend a dollar when you're deep. No, you can't spend a dollar when you're deep. 
singing ding dong dollar. Everybody holler, you can't spend a dollar when you're deep. Oh, the Yanks have just dropped anchor at the noon, and they've had their civic welcome fair too. As they came up the measured mile, Bonnie Mary over Gale was wearing spangled drawers of lower goon. Oh, you can't spend a dollar. Okay, I will stop there. The main person in the inspiration, coordination, and organization of singers at anti nuclear protests and demonstrations in Glasgow and Dunoon was Morris Blythman. Morris was a multifaceted man, a teacher, poet, political songwriter, and slogan maker, protest rally leader and Scottish Republican. Morris wrote poetry and songs under the name Thurso Barrick, combining the names of cities at the northern and southern extremes of Scotland. But the folk revivalists understandably remember him best for his songs. Morris taught at Alan Glenn School in Glasgow in the 1950s, where he started a ballads and blues club in 1953. The Blythman household became one of the most important Glasgow musical centers in the folk revival, where singers and musicians, including tradition bearers such as Jeannie Robertson, of all stripes mixed. Hamish Henderson is considered by many to be the father of the Scottish folk revival. Based in Edinburgh for most of his working life at the School of Scottish Studies, his influence as a poet, writer, teacher, prodigious collector, singer, songwriter, and mentor was considerable. He was a facilitator in the anti-Polaris movement, a friend of Morris's, and played a key role in the production of the Folkways recording. Morris became involved with a campaign for nuclear disarmament, or CND, which was founded in 1958. CND started the famous Ban the Bomb marches at Aldermaston in England that same year. In 1960, the British government gave permission for an American naval presence in the Holy Loch, a sea loch in the Firth of Clyde, as a deterrent to the Russian nuclear threat. The Scottish CND and other allied peace groups, as, as well as people in the local communities, were highly concerned. Morris began writing political protest songs and gathered groups of young singers, including Josh McRae, Nigel Denver, Bobby Campbell, Jackie O'Connor, uh, and Ray Fisher, among others, to sing at anti-Polaris protest rallies and demonstrations. For those in and near Glasgow, going to the protests at the Holy Loch meant taking a ferry to Dunoon the town closest to the main protest sites. Marchers could walk the two and a half miles to the Ardnadam Pier, which was one of the key protest locations. But protests and singing occurred in multiple areas, including the Danoon Ferry and on lorries. Morris printed modern day chapbooks of the songs after the initial marches, and they went through multiple editions with different covers and, and pay attention to this uh, uh, booklet on the right with the Eskimo graphic. Um, I'll say more about that later. Um, Morris reflected on the anti-Polaris songwriting in a 1968 piece in Chapbook. One of the most unusual features of this whole movement was the way in which many of the songs were born. Workshop techniques were employed, and as a result, many of the songs had a communal authorship. In at least one song, as many as 20 people contributed to the final production. I have always believed in mass creation. Ewan McVicker, who was one of Morris's students at Allen Glenn's, asserts in his book, The Eskimo Republic, Quote, the key creators were Blythman himself and Jim McLean, end of quote. 
Jim McLean was a talented songwriter and one of the core people. He was responsible for many of the great lines in the songs. With good insight, McVicker adds, in 1961, what Morris Blythman called the first real singing campaign ever undertaken in Scotland, developed a workshopped agitprop song format for demonstrations so precise and succinct that in some songs, every line and a half, since that may be all the observer hears as the march sweeps past, makes a key point in unambiguous and enjoyable language. The lyrics crackle with energy and wit. The songs were thus made for marching, movement, and quick comprehension. The protests acquired urgency with the arrival of the Proteus, a depot ship for the submarine Patrick Henry, in the Holy Loch on 3rd March 1961. Protesters used canoes and small boats to try to disrupt the arrivals, but their efforts were outwitted by the Americans and the local police in boats. There were subsequent attempts led by canoeists, though I'm unable to determine how many. Uh, on the 21st of May, 1961, there was a major canoe and boat sortie which was repelled with a water hose from the Proteus and the local police hauled protesters out of the water and arrested them. These events inspired a song, the Gleska Eskimos, which we'll hear about shortly. The anti-nuclear songs in Scotland owed much to the American songs of protest and performers, which was freely acknowledged by Blythman and others involved with the song movement. Marion Blythman explains her husband's motivations and the influences he drew on as follows. I'm going to read the first um, and then let Marion speak for herself. Now, people like the Weavers had a tremendously strong influence on the kind of singing that was done, the use of these ballads for a political purpose and ones which were subsequently written were written in the sort of style of the weavers. Morris always used to say his songs really were um, sort of musicalized versions of political slogans. And he was always looking for, looking for a total marriage between the words and the music so that the slogan actually got into people's heads. Mm. You know, ban Polaris, hallelujah, ban Polaris, hallelujah. All that kind of thing. So that when it was really thundered out, it was almost like a slogan. And that was a, a deliberate sort of choice of that was the way to write it. It was with conscious irony that American tunes were used to carry many of the anti-Polaris songs the target of which was American, a point noted by Ailey Monroe in her book on the Scottish folk revival. Ban Polaris Hallelujah was set to John Brown's body and Paper Hankies was set to Yankee Doodle Dandy. The eponymous Ding Dong Dollar, originally called Dolaris, was set to She'll Be Coming Round the Mountain When She Comes, Roud 4204, and used as the tune for the Scottish song, You Canny Shove Your Granny Off a Bus. Using well-known tunes also made the songs easy to learn. Part of the humor came from knowing what the song behind the song was, which was true of many of these songs. Marion Leithman gives an example. Um, there's a famous Scottish song which is called You'll No Shit Here, you, you may have heard it. And that was taken right over and became uh, You'll No Sit Here because the, the protesters all uh, sat down, you know, doing it hard than Adam sitting at the pier when I heard the Polish shout, You'll No Sit Here. That just brought the, the house down because people, everybody knew as a child's song, You'll No Shit Here. So you didn't have to say it, but... 
per se. Uh, and that is really quite within the Scottish tradition, that sort of, as Jeannie says, that sort of dancing up with the irony, not being offensive, but still saying in quite a definite way, you know, shucks to you kind of thing. And here is the song. You can hear a little bit of this. When I heard the Polish shout, you'll know, sit here. I but a wool, sit here. No, but you'll know, sit here. I but a wool, no, but you'll know. I but a wool, sit here. Twas Chief Inspector Runsey and Hansen his career. I'm rancing up and doing the road like Yogi Bear. I but a wool, sit. Ray Fisher was often at the Blythman House and took part in the protests. She was 20 in the spring of 1961 when the protests at the Holy Loch started. She comments, this is rather long, but I feel that it really gives one an understanding from one person's perspective. I used to sing the misguided missile and the misguided miss with great enthusiasm, and um, oh, I was I was uh, I was up in the forefront at the Holy Loch, and, oh. and I was elected in marches and things. And, okay, um, no, I didn't. Yeah. Oh yes, we went on, we sang, we sang concerts. Did um, I was involved in? It. I admit to not having a political um, understanding of what was going on. Mm. I'd, I didn't understand the political side of it at all. Um, I was made to understand it in, eventually in the process, but the music um, he, he was used in, as, as a weapon, and he, but I didn't realise at that time that's what it was, that was what they were doing. They were, uh, what you do is something very serious, you and you, you 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 make fun of it because if you really thought seriously about it, it's horrific the potential danger mm -hmm. that you yes. see. And at that time, um, there were those who were writing the songs, there were those who were saying to you, um, explaining to you what it was all about, and then you sang the songs. You were the singer. In, it was almost like a, an assembly line and oh here's another one we've got another song here right here's one we'll do this one oh you can't sit here ah but I will sit here oh but you'll know sit here ah but I will that was when they moved them all and carried them all off and they were all physically removed from the from the gates of the of the um, the place where the subs were and, mm -hmm. the, and the poor sailors who were standing there with their face trying to keep their faces as straight as possible and and watching um nigel denver plancing around going oh but i will sit here and, and these blokes trying to be on duty you know and be serious there um and and, and singing things so oh, you can't you spend a dollar when you're deed into these blokes ears and they're trying to trying not to be affected by what was happening that was quite i mean i found that quite i, I thought it was very funny at the time I was never ever physically shifted myself. Um, we became quite law-abiding after the Eskimo carry-on, where they went out with the with the canoes. You know, um, did you never hear? No. Uh, well, they well they they went in canoes in an effort to, I think, because the well, our sub had surfaced, and I, I think there was, was some people went out in canoes. How they got there, I'm not quite sure, but, I, but out of that came a song called The Glasgow Eskimos. And um, we'll hear just a little bit of The Glasgow Eskimos. Um, oh, actually, I've got a few comments first. The Glasgow Eskimos was written after the attempts by canoeists to board the Proteus. Captain Lanning of the Proteus reputedly called them a bunch of Eskimos, although Jim McLean. Um, has not been able to find an authoritative account of this despite searching. 
Adam McNaughton comments, Morris seized on the word Eskimo as a link with the Glasgow street song, My Ma's a Millionaire, which includes up among the Eskimos playing a game of dominoes. This particular anti-Polaris song is not politically correct by contemporary standards. It's up the clay come on and the sip of the bar yank. But do the damn sight bigger when we cook them in the stang. Up to the neck and sludges, who it barely stops your swank. We are the Glasgow Eskimos. Hello! The Eskimo story, true or not, adds to the mystique of the Ding Dong Dollar songs, and it is a recurring theme in the movement. Morris's core group of singers and songwriters were also known as the Eskimos, with only two remaining, Marion Blythman and Jim McLean. Um, Anne Nielsen was another young Glasgow singer who had a different perspective on the songs. She was not a student of Morris's. She was actually a student of Norman Buchan, who started a ballads club. So she was very focused on traditional music. But here she is talking about her experience. I, I did join CND and I went on a couple of marches. Um, you know, I remember at that, at that particular kind of time, but I was not part of, of Morris's thing. Uh, I mean, I saw them on the banks of lorries yes. uh, as they performed during a march. Um, and, you know, they were the kind of things that we learned and learned very quickly. And then there was the Ding Dong Dollar Songbook, which came out, and that had much more of Morris's stuff in it. And the very first song on the first page was Rock the Wind, Hamish's song, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, a whole lot of us learned then. Um, and just, you know, regarded as the song. I mean, the other ones were just for singing and making a noise with, but that was the song that had the message. Yes. Uh, and although there were a lot of American type uh, tunes and American style songs, if you like, that, that was the one that counted. Uh, I think everybody knew that even then, um, that the others were, they made a point in a quite different way, mm -hmm. but they were ephemeral, you know, yes. they were not going to last. And, and this was the one that was all, everything was pinned on this song, mm -hmm. uh, saying for all of us what we wanted to say. I'm gonna stop there. Um, So let's hear the first verse of the Freedom Kamalyi, which is heard widely um, up, uh, well, it's been sung by many, many different people. Broke the wind and the clear day's dawn, plus the clouds heels to go dear the day. But there's mer nor a rock when blown through the great glen o' the world a day. It's a thought that would gar the rotten's are the rogues that gang gallus fresh and gay. Tuck the road and seek the lonin's for their ill ploys to his sport and play. Okay. The Freedom Come All Ye is not like the other songs, as Anne says. It would not have been a song to march to, clearly, but it had deep meaning for those who participated in the demonstrations, marches, and concerts. The first recording of this song was on the Folkways LP, 
And that was Jackie O'Connor singing. I do not have time to get into the finer details about the Folkways recording. That, that's kind of like a whole other presentation. But I'm showing a screenshot from the Smithsonian's archival catalog called SOBA. Um, uh, and we're looking at the contents of um, one of the two folders of production materials um, from Ding Dong Dollar. And I like this particular photo, which is not the one that was used on the LP cover, but it shows Morris Blythman very clearly here in the middle with Josh McRae, Nigel Denver, Jackie O'Connor, and Jim McLean. Um, and I provided the link for this information uh, for you in case you're interested in looking at some of these materials. Uh, the, um, the artist credit was given as the Glasgow Song Guild, which was a fictitious organization at Morris's address. The correspondence between Moses Ash, Hamish Henderson, and Morris Blythman in the production files tells much more of the story. The liner notes were compiled by Hamish and Morris and were written primarily for Scots. Um, the recording is a cultural document of this fascinating movement that was Morris's brainchild aided by the Eskimos. The story of the Ding Dong Dollar songs is enriched by the personal accounts and observations of the participants. There are also singers who stayed outside the anti-Polaris movement altogether, like Morris's former student, Andy Hunter, who by this time was at university in Aberdeen. Um, he and Morris had an amicable parting of the ways over his refusal to participate in the political singing. Adam McNaughton was another Glasgow singer who at that time stayed clear of the protest activities and singing. He comments, basically Andy and I would have described ourselves as apolitical, I think. But I mean, Morris's influence on everybody was marked, whether you were on his side or not, because he encouraged everybody to write or sing, you know, one or the other. In many ways, one of the most significant musical consequences of the anti-Polaris protest era in Glasgow was to make young singers and musicians consider what their musical priorities were. There was a fluid relationship between political protest and traditional songs and singing in Scotland. And Hamish Henderson had a firm foot in both these camps. There is no doubt that the anti-Polaris movement had a unique influence on the Scottish folk revival. And I just have my thanks um, to various people. So I can stop. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Another excellent presentation. Um, really, really wonderful. You opened up the whole subject for so many of us and many people are applauding on the screen. So thank you so much. Um, I'm sure there are going to be questions that will have prompted all sorts of memories and uh, times that are familiar to so many. So first up was Conrad. We, um, we're coming on, so if um, questioners can keep it fairly brief, please. Conrad. Got it. Using my laptop is harder. Uh, I think the uh, use of other traditions by uh, another borrowing traditional tunes, especially, is a great way to find legitimacy. Uh, it's in, at least in the Ulster Orange uh, culture, it's amazing that hardly any song or tune that is used by that tradition in Ulster Orange world is not an American standard. And I think they do that to associate politically with the other tradition. That's a good way. Uh, it's always interesting, too, to see that in folk music, the application of folk music to the world, you only find in the revival, as you come into it, uh, a need to uh, 
play your own sides too. I don't know what happens to the pro people, but for some reason they get lost. And it turns out that all the folk music turns to be negative to the issue. I don't know who, there's always, you, you figure that there would be two sides expressing themselves equally. But anyway, nice topic and nice talk, very, very inspiring. Thank you. Um, I know that Morris Blythman used a lot of orange tunes and there is a whole raft of songs from earlier things that he worked on as well, which I had no time to talk about. Um, but yeah, um, use of American tunes, certainly uh, using it against the Americans who were in the Holy Loch. I mean, that's, that's very logical. Thank you. Rosie Upton, you have a question. Right, yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much. That I found that really, really interesting. Um, and my partner, Pete McGregor, who comes from Boness, near Linlithgow, came in and uh, sat in on that. And he really enjoyed it uh, because it was very much uh, of his era when he was at school. Uh, and uh, just as he left, he said, um, are you aware of Willie uh, Kellogg and the Boness Rebel songbook? Uh, because yes. apparently uh, Willie Kellogg was uh, Pete's next door neighbor and very influential in um, Pete then learning uh, and becoming a folk singer. So uh, he just uh -huh. wondered if you knew of w Willie Kellogg. Yes, yes. Absolutely, thank, yes, you. thank you, thank you, Rosie. Uh, Margaret Bennett. Thank you, Stephanie, that was fantastic and uh, very evocative. I, you said about Ray, who didn't really understand the political um, implications at the time. I joined the folk club, she, fa she founded the folk club in, in Glasgow in 59. I was a student in 64 to 67, 8. And Ann Nielsen was in her first year, while I, in her last year while I was in my first. And I remember we sang these songs in the club and then it was announced we were going on a trip down the Clyde and we were going to go to the Holy Loch. And I can remember traveling there and saying, where are we going here? I mean, that's how naive we were in a way. So we were completely unaware that perhaps people who could sing and who probably would have fairly left leanings could be drafted in. Of course, after that, we were half of those probably became members of the CND and um, probably stayed in that place. With, but then fully informed, we really didn't want um, nuclear submarines in the Holy Loch. So it was a very interesting, uh, Stephanie, it's great you, you've brought this out. It's, it has to be out there because I think half of Scotland, more than that, just don't understand this part of our history. Thank you. Well, thank you, Margaret. And clearly I should have interviewed you at the time, but you were my PhD supervisor. So I didn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you? Okay. And I didn't you. either. Oh, we, we have time for one question from Colin Bargery. Oh. Um. Thank you, Stephanie. Fascinating. I'd be interested. Can you put it in, perhaps? Um, uh, can you put it, perhaps, in a, a, a wider context of what was going on um, with um, a protest song at the time? Um, I, one of the songs I've got in my I curate a website called Song from the Age of Steam, and I've got a, a song um, protesting the closure of a a railway um, in Scotland about the same time, part of the famous Beeching's Cut. I uh, just wondered if, as I say, if you could put the, the stuff that you've spoken so interestingly about into a wider context. Um, I may not be the right person to answer that. Um, I believe Ewan McVicker is here. He might have something to say about that. If you and Vicar would like to unmute briefly, um, that would be fine. Uh, Button, am I here? Very faintly. Very faintly. Oh, well, well, there we are. I put the microphone. <laughs> okay. I think the Scots are a troublesome race and have written protest songs and songs of conflict all the way through. 
I think it's one of the contrasts between the English and the Scottish tradition, uh, traditions is just how argumentative the Scottish songs tend to be. Protest songs, part and battle, but again, the key point, we didn't invent it. We learned much of this from the USA, from Pete Seeger, from the, the Weavers were mentioned, but Pete Seeger was the man that we learned so much from. And it was nice that we were able to take it in a different direction. And I always think the use of the American tunes is as much a tribute to the people in America who were complaining about what was being done in their name as it was us protesting against the Americans. And in fact, a lot of these little uh, songbooks, the people who mo bought most of them were the American sailors to send them back home. Oh, right, it's interesting, yeah. The, the particular song I'm thinking about, it was actually set to Bonnie Lass of Fivey, but nonetheless, it's, yeah. it's very much in the same the, the same idiom, the same idiomatic feel to it, to use a slightly swanky phrase. It's still happening, they're doing them all the time here. Mm. Lovely, well thank you to everybody for your comments and a really big thank you to, to Stephanie, that was absolutely great. Thank so we, we are going to move on to our third speaker and uh, now I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him. Um, he's a, a newcomer to a traditional song forum. I hope he knows something about the subject matter. Um, no, of course, he knows practically everything there is to know. So, Steve, are you here? Yes, it looks as if he might be. Yes. Um, oh, and we can hear you. Yes, I am. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Off you go. Right. So. Um, complete contrast to the to the last presentation we're back in the 18th and 19th century for this and it really is just a picture show uh just an excuse for me to show some of the my favorite pictures of ballad sellers and ballad singers and uh the point of this the pictorial evidence is whether or not we can trust the pictures as historical evidence or whether they are just works of art or are they both uh, and in particular if the same image keeps cropping up time after time do we take that as evidence that it must be true because everybody's saying it or simply are they copying each other or working from a stereotype that they you know, that each artist thinks that that's what a ballad singer or seller should look like. So that's how they're going to present them. Um, apologies for those who have sight problems. Um, I can't describe every picture, I'm afraid. Um, we're just going to have to whiz through these. There's hundreds, well, over 100 known pictures of street ballad singers uh, in the 18th, 19th centuries, and we'll just be looking at a few of them. Before we start, if you're interested in this kind of thing, the new book by Oscar Cox Jensen on the left, the first book, as far as I know, that's completely uh, devoted to ballad singers and sellers. Very good, you should all read that. But also, our own Vic Gammon wrote a very good chapter in the book that's on the right there, The Street Literature of the long 19th century. So you should have a look at that as well. Two other things to remember as we go through. One is that it's quite obvious um, once we get into them that there are two traditions here. There's the romantic pictures where the subject is romanticized. And at the other extreme, there's the grotesque pictures of uh, portraying these street sellers and street singers as grotesque you'll see plenty of those in a minute and we're not we don't know which is true and which isn't um if either of them are actually true and another thing to remember is that there were we know all of this from the uh, written evidence that there were professionals who did it for a living all the time there were semi-pros who did it every now and again and there were lots of people who joined in the trade simply because they had no choice. They were poor, they were destitute, and they really did start you know, singing in the street because they had no choice. But there were also professional beggars who used the 
um, broadsides that they were selling as a sort of cover just for begging. And we're told that you could actually hire ragged children to take out with you um, to beg in the streets while singing your songs. So on to this first one, Henry Walton, The Girl Buying a Ballad, my favourite one, of course, lovely picture, 1778. These are not in chronological order, they're in sort of um, theme order. Now we're told that he's uh, ex-sailor and again the historical evidence, the written evidence says that sailors and soldiers often turn to ballad selling uh, once they left the forces by choice or not. But the most important thing here is that he's a pinner up or pinner upper, as I prefer to say. In other words, he stuck his broadsides up on a wall um, and the young lady, the young woman, is choosing the one she wants. Now, this is very different to the notion of a ballad singer gathering a crowd and singing the latest song. In other words, he or she has got one song to sing and sell, whereas this chap has a choice. So does this lady here. A good hundred years later, um, same principle, although I like the um, canvas roll that she's got here so that she can move them out of the rain um, or take them home with her. Uh, completely different people buying from the first picture. We now had boys and an old man choosing. But here, as you can see, she's got dozens, maybe even hundreds of different songs. You could come to this kind of broadside seller and say, have you got a love song? Have you got a battle song? You couldn't do that with the solo singer who was just singing the latest song. And if, as in these sorts of cases, this person had a sort of regular place, um, you could go back week after week. You could say, have you got Barbara Allen? And she would say, uh, no, but I could ask at the printers and see if they've got it. I'll bring it along next week. So it's very different kind of uh, retail model that we're working to. With these pictures, often the broadside seller just appears in the background, or in this case, down the bottom. Um, and I think this is evidence of the fact that they really were ubiquitous, certainly in urban areas, but also in villages. This is a picture of Worcester Cathedral. But um, down the bottom there, because there's a blank wall, somebody's come along and stuck some broadsides and there's two women, a woman selling and a woman buying. And again, this appears to be true that any blank wall, somebody might appropriate it for broadsides or in this case, some railings. I don't always have the dates for these. Um, you're just gonna have to imagine. Um, 1796 for this one, very famous picture because it's part of a Cries of London series. They were, that was very popular, Cries of London or Cries of New York, Cries of Paris, Cries of Edinburgh. In other words, series of pictures of uh, street sellers and um, street cries going on, sometimes grotesque or in this case, sometimes romanticised. By the way, if you're fed, if you get fed up with looking at the broadside sellers, you can play Spot to the Dog. There's a lot of them have a dog in them, but we don't know if that's evidence or artistic license. Here's another lady, another woman selling, but go back one. She looks quite respectable. She's still respectable, but she's obviously poor, patches on her skirt. Um, look on her face and here's our first um, stereotype idea if you like the baby on the back and the baby in arms another very famous picture 1687 marcellus laroon this is the earliest one we're going to see today um, and again this is a, a street cries cries of london kind of thing now, Marcellus Leroux was a Dutch artist of French extraction who had only just moved to England. So we don't know how accurate this is, whether he was 
drawing a picture of um, English London ballad sellers or whether these are actually Dutch ones, we don't know. But because this was widely published, um, it gets endlessly recycled and we'll see evidence of that with other pictures in a moment. This is often misinterpreted, I think, as sellers dancing. I don't think they're dancing. I think they're just caught in um, movement. But they may be doing what the written record tells us is um, singing songs together, not in unison, but he would sing the first line, she would sing the second line, he would sing the third line. Um, we're told that that's what they did, at least in the 19th century. But spot the, um, the hat of the woman, especially, but also the man, because it's details like that that make us realise that things are copied. Because have a look at this one. I don't have a date for this, but it's clearly, I think, modelled on that one. And a merry new song is what they're both called. And then this one, again, I don't have a date, but this is 1780s, somewhere around there. So 100 years after the Marcellus Arun original. But again, the postures and the hats make me think that this is either a direct copy or just somebody remembering, stereotyping. One of the most famous pictures of uh, Broadside Cellar, this is from May Hughes. London life and labour. Uh, now we're told that this is from a daguerreotype. So that, that's an early kind of photograph. So the engraver has worked from a photograph. So it might be the closest we've got to an actual picture of an actual mid 19th century seller. But again, because it's so famous, it um, uh, confuses later writers because they think they presume that this long song that he's selling he's a long song seller was um a common feature of broadside so um and actually long songs were a fad of the 1840s and and 1850s they didn't last long the songsters took over from them and that's not actually one broadside that's three stuck together which is what they did here's one of them, which I prepared earlier, stick three of those together and you get the long song that the man in the top hat was selling. But other people also had long songs. And this one um, reminds us that broadside sellers would often sell other things. He's selling laces and other knickknacks in his tray and his neck. But a very different take on the long song. She looks a lot more cheerful than the man in the in the top hat. Uh, but this reminds us that broadsides were sold from door to door in rural areas, as well as in the street in urban areas. And again, she's selling not just songs, but what uh, ribbons there and what looked like knitting needles or something like that. But it's the songs that the uh, people in the cottage are pleased with. So a bit more grotesque than the last one. Again, this, this is uh, a Cries of London series, but this time um, parodying. And this is the last dying speech. We'll be coming up with those later on, of course. Um, notice the young man over on the right hand side picking the pocket that's a, a common theme in these pictures um that the sellers singers were in league with the pickpocket but notice here obviously the hand to the face the hand to the ear now this could be Ewan McColl in disguise but have a look at the other pictures as we go through and see whether you can spot the hand to the ear because again if it's there often is it because it's real completely different to the grotesque of the last one um i know nothing about this but they are young ballad singers with lovely curly hair 
and a nice dog. Um, but spot here the baskets down in the left-hand corner with the broadsides hanging out. Uh, and again, that's a, a recurrent theme, which we'll notice later on. But I, what strikes me on a lot of these pictures is how much care the engraver or the painting painter has taken in depicting the broadsides themselves. They really do look like real songs. And especially in the 1790s, broadsides really did look like this, uh, you know, slip songs. So one song in a, in a narrow slip with a picture at the top. And they really, the um, illustrators have really tried, I think, to, to make them look real. Where whether the people are real, we don't know. Here's the prize for the best haircut of all these pictures. Um, this is in the later 19th century. As before, he's ragged. He's got patches on his trousers and the hem is looking a bit ragged down there. And the three children there may well be hired for the occasion. We don't know. They may be his ragged children or they might be his audience. This is from a chat book. So this is a picture on the chat book, which the sellers would be selling, as it were. So it's a picture of themselves. But this introduces the idea of the family as a singing unit, or with their mouths open, or singing. And we'll say lots of families from now on. Here's one selling Christmas carols, which we won't don't have time to talk about the Christmas carols. You'll have seen those at our Christmas um, session. And I, I love the holly in his hat and the little girl there holding the holly. But they are clearly poor um, out in the, in the winter winds, as are these people. Now, these aren't actually, as far as we can see, they're not selling anything, but they are singing in the street. So again, we know that people really had to do this. My grandmother in the 1920s ended up singing in the street. So I know this happens. And she had my mother with her at the time. The Jolly Beggars. So those people there are not jolly. These ones are. Uh, we know nothing about them except for the fact that they are jolly. Irish street ballad sellers. We know they're Irish because of the uh, shawl that the lady is holding and the babe in arms. As I said earlier on, the, the broadside seller often appears in a picture devoted to a totally different subject. So this one is obviously about uh, horse racing, but on the left-hand side down here, we have the broadside seller um, with that flat hat that we saw earlier on, we'll see more of that in a minute, and the hand to the ear or to the face. As I say, possibly too fake, possibly uh, a feature of street singing. This is a political cartoon. Sheridan uh, has just lost his seat, so the people at the back are singing the song Sherry Done Over. So the use of the broadside seller as uh, for social comment or protest. Hogarth pictures often have uh, ballad sellers or singers in them. And in this case, the young man right at the front, who is presumably on his uh, one of the guards marching to fin Finchley, uh, 1749, his girlfriend or wife, um, presumably pregnant here, has a basket. Again, we noticed the basket earlier on with the broadsides hanging out. So either she's a broadside seller or perhaps she's just bought, bought some broadsides and they haven't quite made them into her basket as yet. Hogarth's Enraged Musician, 1741. Uh, there's the ballad seller on the left contributing to the noise. The baby is presumably squalling rather than um, actually singing. 
all sorts of nice things going on here. But notice right over on the right hand side, what looks like a coal man or some other street seller doing his street cry, but he has his hand to his ear. So again, uh, you know, is this is this evidence? There's the detail of the um, woman selling the sheets, and we can now see that she's selling the song called The Ladies Fall. Very famous Hogarth pictures, Beer Street. You won't linger on these because you'll remember these from your school uh, history books if you're as old as I am. But the fisherwoman, fish selling lady, has a broadside in her hand. And the skeletal man down in the right hand, bottom right hand corner in Gin Lane also has a broadside. But perhaps the most famous of the um, Hogarth uh, broadside sellers is this woman in the middle here, selling the last dying speech of the idle apprentice. Um, and this has all the features we've noticed so far. She's ragged, she's got a flat, wide brimmed hat, babe in arms, hand to the ear, broadside in hand. And this was endlessly recycled as there. And in this one, 1830s, so this, so this is a, a good hundred years after the Hogarth picture. And this is a woodcut from a real last dying speech publication from London in the 1820s, 30s. And as you'll see at the front here, a very similar picture of the broadside woman. Um, I, I think there's no doubt that this is copied from the Hogarth or copied from something which is copied from something down the hundred years between Hogarth and this one. But I think more interesting, this picture is the, the um, gallows themselves, because that rather sparse gallows, the wood block for this would have had a blank space in the middle. And the printer could add as many or as few hanging criminals as are necessary to go with the broadside itself. So if it said, you know, three murderers were turned off yesterday down at the local nick, um, he would put in three hanging bodies. And of course, you can have males or females. So it means that the printers took a little bit more care than we often think with their, with their pictures. Last dying speech, 1759. Flat hat, ragged clothes, hand to the ear. Back to Hogarth, industrious apprentice. Um, he's just got married and the various people are serenading him and expecting money and charity from him. The drummers, the cello player, the butchers with their cleavers and bones. They used to play tunes and um, sort of imitate bell ringing by whacking their bones on their cleavers. But what we're interested in is the ballad seller down here on the left, a disabled person selling his, her, sorry, ballads. The disabled trope comes in from now on. Uh, no, it doesn't. This, we know why this young woman is being turned out of doors, but over here on the left, you've got a child or a very short woman trying to sell ballads to the people leaning out the window. And she has a fiddle player, presumably with her, or just happening to sit on the steps to play the fiddle. The farmer come to town. This is, you know, up to the rigs of London town on a foolish errand. You can see a foolish errand on the left, two of them, and a broadside seller on the right, smiling at them, or leering, perhaps. Back to the sailor soldier trope we had at the beginning. Now, this chap is disabled. You can see his crutch under his left arm. He's in a rural setting, so he's a wandering sailor, and he's selling, as you can see, ribbons and other knickknacks, um, but it's the broadsides that the uh, boy and the woman are interested in. 
the country ballad singers, again, the curly hair. It, it seems like a lot of them had curly hair, but notice the um, basket down there with the broadsides. Orphan ballad singers, 1850, looking suitably forlorn. The city chanters, not at all forlorn. Um, the woman in the middle is the one selling the broadside. And as you can see in the background, there are various people who have bought them and are reading them. Rowlandson, very famous uh, caricaturist and painter, illustrator, often had ballad singers in his pictures. There's a couple of them. A beggar girl, notice the basket, although the broadsides are in her hand. Various other. Now this one is um, positively you know, Virgin Mary-like, Madonna and Child, very odd looking baby. But the baby on the back all the same. Um, and again, the broadside looks quite real. In fact, it's the most real thing in the picture. Rowlandson, again, the ballad singers. Now, this is often printed as people selling ballads, but I think they have just bought this ballad. I don't think they're selling them because they're not singing to the crowd or to the onlookers. They're singing or reading to themselves. Here's a nice instance of um, custom ballad customers. The chap on the right in raptures because of the singing, uh, the sweet singing of the woman on the left. But notice the baby on the back also singing, the child and the um, basket, although I'm not sure they are ballads hanging out of the basket. They look like socks to me. But this is paired with weeping. People so affected by the sad song that they've just bought that they can't control themselves. Somebody else who's just bought a ballad, we presume. Um, we don't know anything. I don't know anything about this. I don't know if the young man is her brother or her, um, her beau, but either way, they're engrossed in the song. Now, this one, I just put this one in to remind. Uh, women who are listening, maids when you're young, never wed an old man. Uh, and if he says, come up and see my broadsides, don't go. This one has everything. Ex-soldier, ragged trousers, disabled, fiddle playing, barefoot boy. The woman has the baby on the back and the basket with the broadsides hanging out and the ragged clothes. This has everything we could possibly want from a ballad singer, apart from the dog. Sorry if I'm going too fast here, but I've got an awful lot to get through and I've forgotten what time I started. So the fiddle player and the family, uh, the joke here is Paganini was a very famous violinist of the time, as you will know. man uh, practicing to be disabled. The written record tells us about broadside sellers carrying um, things to stand on to raise them above the crowd. So this is evidence of that. Um, not a very substantial looking IKEA stall there, but uh, this one a bit more substantial. This is from a woodcut. And this also from a woodcut of the broadside, he's standing on a handy bollard by the looks of things. So here we have some um, ballad sellers in the snow. Christmas was a special time for broadside sellers. But of course, it snows then. Uh, and again, there were. Um, a lot of pictures like this, romanticized pictures of children selling out in the snow, and mostly they are selling these large uh, Christmas broadsides. 
And then this one is my marker for stopping, even though there's probably 20 or 30 that we haven't looked at yet. Um, this uh, is, a, I think, from, from a John Ashton book, Real Sailor Songs, I think, if I remember rightly. So this is a sort of 1890s notion of um, what broadside sailors used to look like. So that's all I'm going to do as of today. Stop sharing. And, and there we are. That's that's the pit. That's today's picture show. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. That was absolutely wonderful. I did enjoy that. So many different styles, different angles on the whole business. It's absolutely brilliant. And lots of applause coming your way from uh, from people out there. So, thank you. I oh, I saw a a yellow hand and then it disappeared again. So, is it going to come back, Frankie? Yes. There you go. Right. Oh, Steve, that was fantastic. And thank you for mentioning those of us who have visual impairment. But actually, you gave us so much information that certainly for me, with what little I could see, I really could piece things together. So, so that was terrific. And uh, also to say that I did meet the poet William Plumer, back in the late 60s, it probably was. And he distinctly said he remembered as a youngster seeing street ballad sellers with their hands behind their, their hand behind their ear cupped to, to amplify the sound out of doors. Yes, I mean, I, mean, I, I must admit, I was one of those people who used to think that it was a sort of, you know, folky affectation until I started looking at pictures. Uh, and it's clear that you know that that, that they did, that they did do it. Um, why they did it, I'm not quite sure. Whether it was to cut out the not you know other noise going on or whatever. Um, but I I think that's one of the things that comes out of the pictures. And there are lots more uh, that straight sellers really did put their hand to their to their ear. Thank you. Um, we'll we'll rattle along. Uh, David Atkinson, if you'd like to ask. Hi. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the hand thing may be to do with um, a way of illustrating just how noisy the streets were, but that wasn't really what I was going to say. Um, can we draw a distinction between the ones where you can see what the actual ballad is? Ah and the ones that are just generically a load of ballads. I'm thinking particularly virtually all of the Hogarth ones, the titles of the ballads that he uh, shows actually matter. I think um, the March of the Guards to Finchley, if I remember rightly, the, the prettier lady has a sort of loyalist, uh, you know, God save the king or something in her basket. And um, the other uh, woman's supposed to be a, a Catholic, a, a Jacobite. I, I can't remember exactly why. Perhaps just because she's pregnant. I had to mention that because I'm broadcasting to you from Finchley, especially yes, around. Indeed, I thought of you as uh, as we showed the picture. Yes, Hogarth, Hogarth definitely does do that. He he matches the song um, with the with the picture in some ways. Sometimes commenting on it, and sometimes just underlining what uh, what the picture is about. You know, the ladies fall and so on. Um, so yes, if, if you look closely at them, they, the songs do actually matter. But most of the other ones that are showed, um, they just seem to be generic um, broadsides. Um, so it it's, it's, doesn't matter what they're singing, it's just what, you know, they are there, I, I think. But uh, we have to look much closer, you know, more closely at them. I, I think it's only nowadays recently that we've started actually looking at them properly um, rather than just saying, oh, aren't they nice pictures? Okay, thank you. Right, um, we can, we have time for two more quick questions. Uh, John Baxter, um, if you'd like to go now. Yeah, it was just um, clearly sometimes these things are caricatures and it's difficult to know where reality ends and caricature begins. Uh, I may be mixing up the ballad sellers with ballad singers, but gem bags being a caricature that appeared on stage in um, the 1830s and, and 40s and 50s, uh, 
caricature of a ballad singer that was mistaken for um, a nobleman and much hilarity ensues. Uh, I'm not sure when it started being something that appeared on, on stage, but clearly that caricatures of street singers and, and ballad tellers did appear in, on stage as well as, um, you know, in pictorial form. I don't know if you've got any comment on that. Yes, I mean, you're dead right. Um, and ballad tellers on stage really, I mean, it goes back to Shakespeare and Winter's Tale, Autolycus, uh, and others of that era. But if you look at Oscar Cox Jensen's new book, he's got a whole chapter on what he calls representations. Um, and it was quite a fad for ballad sellers and singers to appear in plays, um, sometimes as a main character, often as somebody disguised, as you say, you know, like a beggar coming on and really it's you know Duke of something or other or whatever. Uh, but also he, he comments on ballad sellers appearing in novels in the 19th century and even fancy dress balls, masquerades. There was always somebody who went dressed as a ballad seller, which I didn't know about. In other words, they were part of the, the popular culture of the time. And as you say, again, caricatured um, and parodied and endlessly, and again, I think that's one of our problems is how, how to sort out which is which if, if we're looking for historical evidence. Um, but we start by putting them all side by side and um, comparing them, I, I think is the answer. Thank you. And a last question from Ian Russell, please. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. Um, enjoyed looking at the pictures and uh, trying to spot the uh, various um, motifs and so on that they and that you drew attention to as well. Now, um, in Dundee and in other cities in, I think, Northern Ireland, as well as in parts of Scotland, we had the Poets Box, which uh, were, was a retail organisation that printed ballads and sold them, as you know very well. Um, do we have anything equivalent in England to the Poets Box as an organisation and are they represented anywhere in photographs or, or, or engravings? Uh, the, the, I didn't get, uh, we have a picture of the Poets Box. I know uh, we do, I just Dundee. wondered if we had yeah. e equivalent organisations in England and if they are a, a feature of any representations. I know there's photos of the Poets Box. Yeah, um, I, d I was going on to say, I don't know of any such organisation in, in England. Um, the Poets Box sort of, it was quite different to just an ordinary printers in that they, they sort of set themselves up, set up as a sort of club, you know, come, come along and by the late, you know, we're going to publish a song every week um, and come to the poet, the poet's box. I know of nothing like that in England, although many printers did say uh, we will publish X number per week. Some of them said we had 4,000 ballads in stock um, and they published catalogues, but none of that came anywhere near, I don't think, the sort of club atmosphere of the poets' boxes. And, and there were at least three of them, weren't there? There was a Dundee one, an Edinburgh one, probably a Glasgow one at different times. Yeah, um, I think there was one in Ireland as well. Uh, yes, you, you, you may well be right. But uh, the answer is no, in England, I don't think we did. Mm -hmm. Well, that seems as if we've uh, wrapped up yet another absolutely fascinating afternoon. Steve, thank you very much for that. Uh, much enjoyed by, by everyone I know. Uh, thanks to, of course, to Nia and Stephanie. Uh, all three papers, presentations, um, really fascinating and one can tell from the enthusiastic uh, comments, uh, everyone enjoyed it. So thank you all, don't forget next time is the 27th of June when there'll be three more papers. So we shall look forward to seeing you then. Bye for now. <laughs>